Hello, everybody. Welcome to another stream on Professional Genealogist Reacts, where I answer your DNA tests and genealogy questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. We're actually getting started at a uh, closer hour to, to 2 p.m., the original set time that I usually aim for. Um, been hitting a lot of 3 and 4 p.m. streams, so 2.30 is not too bad. Welcome, everybody. I see we're a little bit lighter of a crowd today, but still a lot of you. Rosie, hello. Thank you for joining. Anna Tommaso coming in from Western New York. Thank you for joining. A familiar name and face. We have Tyler. Hello. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Monica from Sweden. We've been Scorpion. Hello from Faroe Islands. Got to represent the small endogamous societies. Oh, yeah. We have Barbara coming in from Winnipeg. Misty from Charlotte, North Carolina. First time listening live versus replay. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we have Maven here. I'll be wiki treeing during this stream. Also, did you see the Putin Tucker interview? Weird stuff. I saw clips of it, but not going to really talk about that today. <laughs> Alexandro, welcome. Coming in from Koblenz, Germany. We have Stig from Oslo. Excuse me, I have to sneeze. telling you with this weather and the fronts coming in and out warm fronts cold fronts warm fronts kills my allergies i think every stream i'm basically talking about that but welcome uh stig leslie coming in from santa cruz welcome sean from ireland drea coming in from snowy massachusetts yeah the uh, new england really got hit didn't they uh jan coming in from st albans england welcome or yawn I'm not sure. Jan or Jan? Uh, Donna coming in from Detroit. Hello. Welcome, Donna. And professional allergen reacts once again, as always. So um, as usual, I think, yeah, we've got a lighter crowd. So I imagine most everyone here is pretty familiar with the live streams now. But for those who aren't, I'll be answering questions today, mostly from the Reddit. Let's see, is that better? Let's do this. Uh, mostly from the Reddit. I will try to keep an eye on chat and answer questions from chat. The only questions that I guarantee that I will answer from chat are the ones that are super chats or super stickers. Part of the reason just being that they pop up really easily where I can see them instantly and tell exactly uh, what's going on. Um, okay, yeah, I do have it on the right stuff. I see some more people... Uh, uh, popping in we have Jacqueline coming in from Washington State welcome we have Brian Nash from how we got here genealogy welcome Brian good day uh, and Tasha coming in from Minnesota so I um I took a look ahead of time at uh what questions we do have I've kind of decided to start doing that from now on that way I kind of have a, a little bit prepared and then you know we'll do some questions that are completely off the cuff that I'm not expecting um, but as usual, going from the top uh, of all time and just seeing what the top stuff is. And as you can see, most of it's reviewed. So the hope with this is that we'll get some of the older questions, but at the same time, we'll also get a lot of the questions that are ones that everyone's upvoted. And so those that have higher upvotes obviously will get higher up in the list. So if you have a question you see on Reddit that, you know, you really like, upvote, and then there's a higher chance that that's going to be seen on the stream. So the first one that we have is actually a, a, a somewhat recent one, although it's they say it's a repost. I didn't go to see when they're reposting from, but Unique Blueberry, blah, 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 Unique Blueberry says, Hey, Genie Vlogger, I like your vlogs, and I need some advice on this family mystery. Oh, yeah, let me... Uh, Make it easier to read for everybody. That should be a lot better. My second great-grandmother was born in 1874. The town and state where she was born are not definite, but most census records say she was born in Kansas. These are my notes from the records. 1879, said on the 1880 delinquent, defective, and dependent census, at age five, admitted to an asylum for orphaned children in Kansas separated from her brother. The brother was mentioned in a newspaper article. 
1880, age six at the asylum. In the same 1880 census, it says her parents were alive, abandoned her, and surrendered their control over her to the orphanage. Also, she says that her origin was not respectable and they rescued her from criminal surroundings. 1885, at age 10, she's living in Kansas with a widowed woman. I found the woman's son and his family living next to her. I found many matches connected to a family living in Kansas that moved from Indiana, seen in the 1875 census in the town next to where my second great-grandmother's asylum was. There is a DNA match of about 68% match to my parent, which we're going to talk about that, <laughs> from grouping matches. It seems to be coming from my second great-grandmother's side. Was that, was that family close relatives of hers? They did have children who would be old enough to be a parent or grandparent of hers that seemingly disappeared between the 1850 and 1860 census. Another one disappeared after the 1880 census, has the same name as the great-grandparent to the 68% DNA match of my parent. The birth years are pretty close too. The birth is the same Indiana. Can it be the same person? Thank you. And this is from Rosie. Um, and no comments. I didn't think there'd be because there weren't any an hour ago when I checked. So there's a, a few things to say first off. Um, Blue Unique Blueberry is doing a great job here of setting up the timeline to best understand the story. So we have the birth, 1874, 1879, admitted to an asylum, 1880, get a bit more information about the, the the parents, but not much, but she's still in the asylum, age 10. Now she's living with a widowed woman. And then uh, from there, they found a lot of DNA matches, or is it just one DNA match? Okay, yeah, I found many matches connected to the family living in Kansas that moved from Indiana. Uh, seen in the 1875 census in the town next to where my second great grandmother's asylum was. There is a second, or there is a DNA match of about 68% to my parent. Now, I, I'm guessing that this is some sort of an error with what they're saying here in terms of 68% match. Because in terms of matching as a relative, if they're matching at over 68%, that means that they're a. a parents that likely is related to your other parents as well <laughs> um so you know the the it there's some sort of a, a miscommunication going on here um let's see where is okay so if you look here we have the shared sent to morgan project and 68%, you're sharing 3,720 centimorgans. And if you notice, that's actually the upper limit. And so what it really what it really boils down to is it boils down to which test you're taking and how they're reading the, the DNA. Um, but let's see, what is it? It says 50. Yeah, so if you notice, yeah, 50, 68% is actually not 3,700. 20 cents of Morgans. If you look, 50%, and let's see, 49. So after 50%, it just caps out at 3,720 cents of Morgans. Um, yeah, I, I do see the, yeah, thank you, DJ's Variety Channel. I was considering that, that they meant 6.8%, which is a significant one. Uh, 8%. We're looking at 506 cents of Morgans, which is a, a really good match. And if this is the case from grouping matches, it seems to be coming from my second great grandmother's side. Well, they also mentioned that there seem to be multiple people from this family, not just this. We're going to just go with 6.8%. <laughs> so not just a 6.8% match. So going off of that, um, you know, one thing we can do is we'll review what are the most likely scenarios of how they're related. So who's this matching to? Um, oh, to, to the parent. So, and then we're talking about the second great grandmother's family. So 
the the big question is is what age is the parent and what age is the dna match because from there we would then make a hypothesis of which generation do we think it likely is so you know if the hypothesis is that you know or not the hypothesis but let's say their ages are about the same so the parents in this 6.8 percent dna match are about the same then we would presume it it's going to likely be either the same generation or just one up or down. Um, whereas let's say there was a 30 year gap between their births and the parents that's DNA testing was born 1960. And then this DNA match was born 1930. Well, then we'd have a higher likelihood of being one generation up or down, but there's always the possibility that it's still the same generation or even that it's two generations up up or down um but that's the first thing but the next thing is is that if you do have multiple matches from this same family especially ones where you know how they're related to the 6.8 percent match so let's say you have this 6.8 percent match and then there's another cousin of theirs that's only a two percent match which is going to be about 140 centimorgans so you know two percent 149 so you know you have a lot more going on but using using both of those, what you can do is then create a what are the odds hypothesis um, or use use the what are the odds tool. And that's through DNA Painter. And I'm not going to go into exactly how to use it. I have tutorials, which I suggest people watch, although uh, they do have some newer uh, versions of it than when my tutorial came out. But it's basically that you build a family tree of this related tree so like the 6.8 percent match and then you build the tree out so it connects to what other dna matches from the same family of theirs that you have and then you uh hypothesize where does your parent fit in because your parent is the one that's doing the dna testing so if your parent's the one doing the dna testing it'll show you you know hypothesis one your dna match is likely uh related here um here let's Let's see if I can pull up something that uh, will help me explain this. So, yeah, perfect. Perfect. So, here... Oh, let me check. Okay, yeah, it is coming in. So here we have a what are the odds hypothesis for when I built the family tree for Mr. Beat using only his DNA matches. So when I did that, the idea was, was that I was not only going to build it based on only his DNA matches, I was going to use it on or I was going to do it only using information that I would receive if it was an investigative genetic genealogy case. So like a, you know, a an unknown human's remains case, a doe case, or identifying a perpetrator of a violent crime. And, you know, I, I did that work for almost five years, solving many, or helping, so, uh, helping solve many crimes um, and identify lots of remains. And through that work, you know, I saw exactly what we get to use in those investigations, which I know a lot of people are always kind of wondering, what do they actually get to see? And when you DNA test, what you see with your matches is the same stuff they see in this investigative stuff. The only difference is the investigative stuff is limited even more. So that's how I built these trees. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. There we go. So when I built out the family tree for Mr. Beat, I only used his DNA matches and going through his DNA matches, I then built out this, what are the odds hypothesis? So Mr. B is the DNA tester. So same as your parents. And then these are all of the matches that were matching Mr. B. And so we can see that we have one who's a child of this Robert, one who's this daughter, daughter of the daughter of Ethel. And then we have two children of this person who's also DNA tested as well as another family member. So we have multiple branches represented, but largely we're seeing that we've got descendants of Ethel and Margaret. So we're confident Mr. Beat must descend from Casper Lee Spinette B. Rogers, which he does. So in building that out, 
we then do a suggest hypothesis. Um, so you know what? Yeah, we're going to remove suggested. So make it really simple. So this is the family tree that we've built. Mr. Beat, born 1981. And then we have a general idea of when all of these people born. 1940s, 1950s, 1960s to 1980s, sort of. So this would be about Mr. Beat's generation, about one or two up. So it's really simple tree that we've built out here. We have, you know, all of the DNA matches and just the simple connection of how they connect. Now we do suggest hypothesis. And so now it's going to suggest a whole lot of stuff. And not all of this is really going to make a lot of sense. So for one, like up here, you know, there's no way that Mr. B, like, there's just no way that he, he's going to uh, be there. So we're going to, you know, you want to, you want to kind of clean stuff up because part of the idea with this is that, you know, you're making it a visual representation to help you in understanding it. Oh yeah, I need to unmute myself. <laughs> so we can do that with uh, this branch too. Um, you know, I, it, it's, it could have been possible that it's this far out, but honestly, I think, you know, this branch is unlikely. This branch is still kind of likely because it does, you know, you have a hypothesis there. Um, but one thing to understand with how this works is that these hypotheses, the scores are based on the other hypotheses. So we, we have a lot of hypotheses here, but like, there's no way he, that Mr. Beat's going to be here. So we're going to remove that hypothesis. And I don't know if it changed it. Let's see. Yeah. It didn't really change any of the other scores. Um, but let's, we're going to delete these. I don't, yep. There we go. So as I'm deleting it, you may have noticed that the scores have slightly changed. They've altered because they're comparing from one to the other um okay i see i see some people commenting maybe 68 cents oh wow i for some reason i thought you meant 6.8 percent, but yeah you said 68 centimorgans which is possible but that would be pretty distant and i yeah i i don't know that's interesting i do see rosie commenting yes it was for my parents dna matches so Rosie, yeah, can you if you can clarify 68 centimorgan, 6.8%. Um yeah. Oh, Stephen Milsap, thanks for joining. <laughs> What's up, Home Skillet? Um okay. Yeah, Rosie, I'll keep an eye on chat to see if you you post uh, any anything further. But just to keep going with this, so now we've cleaned this up pretty well. And, you know, there's always a possibility that Mr. Beat would be down this generation, but they've given all these hypotheses based on a lot of different things. So one thing that you may notice is like here, this hypo there's a hypothesis here, but if we put a hypothesis here, I'm pretty sure it'd be zero. So yeah, it's zero. So the reason for that is because this descendant is a full sibling of Leslie and this person who's DNA tested whereas this descendant would be from a half sibling. Um, so they, for some reason, unless you do that, <laughs> it won't color code it right. Um, I think it's just a code glitch sort of thing, but the color codes kind of help make it more, more understandable. So you can see here, like they've added an unknown half sibling in case maybe there was one. And I think they had a descendant there, but we're just going to go ahead and delete that. Um, and then here we have an unknown sibling and then same thing. No way. Basically if Mr. Beat descends from Margaret or Ethel, he would have to descend from them through a different man than who all of these other siblings are uh, descending from. Um, oh, I see. Ro Rosie said 68 centimorgans. It's supposed to be 68 centimorgans. Okay. So uh, let's, um, I need to do this to make sure I don't accidentally share the wrong things. 
So with 68 cents to Morgans, we are looking at a lot of possibilities. And if you do have multiple matches that are also matching this 68 cent to Morgan match, uh, where they're, you know how they're related to the 68 cents to Morgan match, then you can do this. What are the odds tree? But right now, 68 cents to Morgans, it's pretty far out there. It is good to, to have a, a starting hypothesis, which it sounds like you do have. Um, um, but it's definitely going to take a lot more work. And if you haven't uploaded to the other databases that have that available, highly suggest it because there may be matches out there that you just don't realize or in this other database. And once you match there, then you'll be able to figure things out further. Um, so not sure. Yeah. Not sure if you're going to be at the point to be able to build a, what are the odds tree like this just yet? Um, but if you are presuming, the way that you do it, so now that we have it dwindled down where we've kind of cut it down to make more sense, all of these hypotheses based on what I know make more sense, and we cut off all of the stuff that's just at such a low possibility, I think it's just highly doubtful. Now they have these hypotheses, and the hypotheses are slightly dependent upon the ages that you do put in. Because if you put in the birth year, it does, as long as you are in uh, the 2.0, which I think this is 2.0, um, it should take that into account. And you can always look down below and it gives you your much further information about what, how is it coming up with it. So it shows, okay, well, this map, based on this match that you have in here, this high one, that, you know, hypothesis one they would be this to you hypothesis or not to you, but to the DNA tester hypothesis two, they'd be this to that person and so on and so forth. And so it gives you an idea of how confident they would be in that relation. So you can see with some of these, you know, if it's hypothesis seven, it's possible, but it's, it's, it's a much lower um, probability. So you can kind of get a, a better idea going through some of that to see um, but it, it, it kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't focus too much on the age. So a lot, a lot of times what you'll notice is you'll notice certain numbers keeping score. So like through each generation. So here, if you notice, we have score 68 hypothesis 15. And as we go over one and down one says score 68 over one and down one says score 68. And then same thing here, score one, score one, but then notice here, hypothesis five to hypothesis three, score two to score two. Then all of a sudden hypothesis three to hypothesis two, it's not a two, it's a nine. And I think part of that is, is because this hypothesis is descending from someone where there's a set age. So like, let's say that we named this sibling and we set the age. So let's say that they were born in 1920. Uh, didn't change it. <laughs> um, thought it would. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can mess around with the age if it does anything with it. Details. Let's say nineteen seventy now. Okay, there we go. So it does so it does take it into account. It just, you know, I guess it, it it's it it may not take things into account as much as you may expect it to. Uh, but we'll take that out because so it is important in terms of the age, but uh what was I doing? There we go. The main point I really want to get at now is once you are able to build out to a point like this, now what you want to do is you need to figure things out yourself. And the first thing you do is basically presume the same thing that they're kind of doing here in terms of the age, what generation you'd expect it, and then focus on the hypotheses that way or by the strongest hypotheses. So each hypothesis you notice has a different score. So we notice the biggest hypotheses are these three, and they even label it strongest, eight, six, and four. So now we have our strongest three. We want to then figure out what's our next strongest. But what we also need to consider is what's the 
the next lowest score because if the next lowest score is pretty close to it, the hypotheses are kind of very similar. So the, the rule of thumb that I always hear with this is um, for a hypothesis score to be a much like a step higher in confidence, it actually needs to be a score 20 times larger than the previous. So with 68 to 14, that's not 20 times larger. That's only five times larger, if not even that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like four point something larger. So it is a stronger hypothesis is 68, but we definitely need to consider that that's still kind of a strong one. Although, I don't know, it's kind of questionable with the half sibling sort of thing in there. But either way, the next step is now we focus on the age and presumed generation. Mr. Beats born 1981. This generation is the generation with people that were born in the 1980s. So this would be the presumed highest uh, likelihood. And so that would be score 68. But the next highest likelihood would be either one generation up or down because there is always that possibility. Now, when we go on a generation up, all of the people born in the generation from everything I could see, those were all born in the 1930s, 1940s. I think some of them might have even born in the 1920s uh, because there were multiple you know, siblings here, not just these two. And so we could also look at when they died and see you know, how likely would it have been for them to have a child born in the 1980s? Very, very unlikely. But... With this generation, there were people that were born as early as the 1940s, I believe, but mostly in the 1950s, 1960s. So it's certainly possible one of them could have also had a child born in the 1980s. So our next strongest hypothesis would actually be this hypothesis, hypothesis four. And when we did um, further testing, I believe that's actually what we found was it was, it was hypothesis four. Now, the difference here being that we're looking at a uh, sibling, half-sibling half deal again. Oh, wait, no. Remove hypothesis. Define half sibling. Oh, there we go. Okay. So <clears throat> if Mr. Beat descended from a half-sibling from Ethel or Margaret, meaning that only Casper or Nepi are going to be an ancestor, then he'd most likely be a grandchild of that half-sibling there. But if it's a full sibling, it would be a great grandchild. And that's what he ended up being. So you can see how even though this generation was kind of the one where, yeah, there's a lot of people we already see being born in the 1980s, um, you know, it was the next generation that ended up being where he was. So, okay, hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully I didn't start too much towards, towards the end of that. Uh, let's... Um, Mark is reviewed and then Rosie's here. So I'm not going to comment that it was answered. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. Uh, Anna has to bounce. Uh, sorry that you have to go, but thanks for joining us for the little bit of time you were able to join. Um, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, Rosie, I do see you have another question. Um, I'm going to get to some other stuff uh, first. You can ask it again a little bit later, um, but oh, you can always also post it again as something to ask in uh, the Reddit again. Um, but let's go on. We have, uh, let's see, where was it? I think, yeah, I think this was it. And I don't think they had a question. If I remember correctly, it was just kind of, uh, comparison just you know here's the results and yeah sporty blocks okay let's see i looked on a map west asia doesn't include france what do i do on genie.com i have relatives in spain well hundreds of years back recent common ancestor the most common dna is ireland dad's side and scottish mom's side i should have way more groups but this is what i got thoughts um okay so let's take a look so first all right so we have melissa's dna this is ancestry yeah ancestry then we have family tree dna my origins and then we have my heritage so okay 
So my heritage, we have 84.7 English, 9.5% Irish, Scottish, Welsh, 5.8% West Asian, and then four additional genetic groups. Um, interesting with the 5.8% Asian, then here for my origins, 100% Europe, 64% Ireland, 37% Central Europe. And then for ancestry, 1% Baltics, 2% Wales, 2% Sweden, Denmark, 4% Norway, 23% England, Northwestern Europe, and then 33% Scotland, and then something else up there that we can't see. I don't think, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, I, I mean, I, it's obviously Ireland up there. I th I'm pretty sure it's Ireland. I don't know if it's named something like, you know, Ireland and England or something like that. I, the, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people would assume that being a professional genealogist, I would kind of remember which companies keep which, you know, population group names, but they do change throughout the years. And honestly, I, I, I focus so little on the admixture stuff. And I say it all the time. I focus on it so little because it's not that important in all honesty. I talk about it more on the channel than anything else because it's just the thing that everybody asks about. Um, but from what I would say, I mean, we have ancestry and family tree DNA both saying 100% Europe. This 5.8% West Asian seems pretty out of the ordinary. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not possible, but it, it it's it. I'm not too certain surprise because one of the biggest downsides with my heritage is that they are known for having the uh they're they're known for having admixtures which are, are reportedly the most off from what people who have built out trees expect to get and the other downside with that is is that my heritage doesn't have a white paper where we can see the actual precision and recall and the information behind how they're getting this in, uh, or how they're defining things and how the, the data behind that. And so, you know, that, that is one downside. The, the funny thing is, is though, that that's the biggest downside, in my opinion, about my heritage's <coughs> DNA test result stuff. And in all honesty, all of the other stuff they have for the DNA matches, the shared matches, comparisons, all of that, they have like the best site out of all of them. 23andMe was the only one that could even come close. And since 23andMe stopped um, a lot of those tools, basically after they had that data data breach, uh, 23andMe dropped immensely in its usefulness in genealogy. And my heritage is now highly at the number one spot. And with everything Ancestry is doing right now, honestly, it's giving my heritage a really good shot at kind of swooping in and picking up a huge part of the market um which will be interesting to see if it if that does happen but you know hopefully they'll eventually release a white paper or something and i think they also they haven't updated their results in a while i, I can't remember so yeah let's see what uh everyone else says uh, my heritage gave you west asian too it gave me like 12 percent on mine but not on my other tests yeah it might be just that because of how they're reading all of these different population groups, there's something about people with Northwestern European getting West Asian. And maybe it's a specific um, connection between not just Northwestern European, but maybe like one of the specific population groups in Northwestern European. Um, yeah, nobody else really says anything of uh, importance. So, okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, not, not really much to answer there, but interesting to kind of see across and, you know, you can see with the different uh, percentages, how, you know, that Northwestern European just kind of varies a little bit here and there. <coughs> okay. This question. February 13th, 2024. Hey. All right. Let's check chat. 
Um, Yeah, Leslie says, I think France doesn't allow DNA tests coming out of the country right now. If it did, perhaps I would have higher numbers of matches in some kits I manage. Yeah, I don't know the exact law and the details. I mean, people who are in France can, you know, get around it in a way. Um, I don't know, you know, how harsh the laws are, you know. I mean, technically, they can travel to any country outside of France and go DNA test. Israel has another law too that I don't know what the exact law is, but I know there are, I have a lot of matches who are Israeli, um, you know, especially on my heritage, which is also based in Israel, um, but they can't sell it to them in Israel or ship it to Israel or something like that. And then unfortunately that's something that's been used as, you know, one of these conspiracy theories by, you know, a lot of different extremists. Um, Yeah, they don't have they don't allow DNA tests that have matches due to privacy is what I've read. Yeah, I mean, I imagine any laws like that are going to be about privacy. And there was a, a minute there in the U.S. where health tests were um, uh, banned and or at least at least uh, th there was enough of a uh, threat that. Weren't available to, for consumers for a little while, or at least companies didn't offer it. I don't remember exactly what it was. It was kind of towards the beginning of when I was in getting into the DNA testing stuff. I didn't care. I've always just been focused on the genealogy stuff. So when it came to the health, the traits, the admixture stuff, all of that, I really didn't care as much or keep up with things as, as much as, you know, others may have. Um, let's see. Do you think they will ever update the MyHeritage estimates? I hate what Ancestry have done with their subscriptions. I hope MyHeritage does update their estimates i mean you know to me out of everything they offer for their dna test it's kind of like the 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 black spot on their their record i guess you could say um because you know they have the best dna match tools they have auto clusters available they have pretty good chromosome browsers available they have the best shared matching stuff available because with shared matching, one of the biggest things is not only seeing how much do you match your matches, but how much do those shared matches match each other? Because that, that's going to determine how you look at it. Because there's always the possibility that, you know, you have shared matches with someone, but they just match each other because of just, you know, they have one really small segment or something like that. And so, you know, when you are on Ancestry and you get your shared matches, which right now, for those who aren't familiar, uh, Ancestry is changing their terms so that you have to have a subscription to access shared matches, I think, and, and some other stuff too. Um, but when you look at your shared matches on Ancestry, you just see that they're shared matches. You don't see how much those matches are matching each other. My Heritage does that. They also let you see when there's triangulating segments, and you know there there are some you know their their system could always use some uh, various improvements. In my opinion, you know, I've run into some issues, especially I notice a lot of people when they do triangulation on my heritage, they'll see stuff that they're like, you know, to me, I see the data, I see the information, it seems like it should triangulate. Why is it not? Um, so there are some spots where maybe they could use some improvements, but overall, they are the best for DNA matching genetic genealogy tools. And their admixtures really don't rise up to the the bar they've set on their dna matching side and, and the biggest downside to that is that that seems to be the largest concern for the consumer market i mean especially for the people that want to do the dna tests and then be like okay cool i got my percentage I, i'm done which i think a lot of us know that's a lot of people um so you know i would hope that my heritage would take the time to start if they haven't already, because I imagine they probably are, um, you know, working to improve their ethnicity admixtures. And I would hope, cross my fingers, they put out a white paper with it. Um, oh, my heritage updated ethnicity estimate a few months ago. I, I 
did not know that. I missed that. Let me see. Because did I don't know if they updated the ethnicity estimate or did they um, update the uh, community stuff? I see an article they have on their site about it. But I don't see... Yeah, see, I, I don't see anything about them updating their ethnicity estimates anytime recently. Unless, I mean, I could be wrong. Let me see. Yeah, but I I think they've been updating their the community stuff. Or genetic groups, DNA genetic groups. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like looking through articles and stuff, trying to see if I can find anything that says anything uh, definitive. But I'll have to look into that. Um, okay, good day. When you have thousands of matches, lots without trees, how do you organize them to find out where they come in the tree? Well, the first thing to do when you have thousands of matches is... Um, one, identify if there's any specific DNA issues that you're going to run into. The main thing being endogamy, but then also recognizing, do you have any double relatives? So, you know, where you have a lot of siblings that are marrying people that are, gosh, it's always so hard to, to put the multiple relations. But basically think like multiple relations is like if your parents married and then their siblings married as well. So like your mom's sister and your dad's brother married each other. Um, they're, those cousins would be your double first cousins. They'd be cousins from your first, your mom and your dad's side. But that can happen in a lot of different ways. So there's endogamy, there's double cousins, and then there's pedigree collapse. So that's when you're descending from an ancestor or a set of ancestors who are related to each other. So, you know, if your grandparents were first cousins, you're going to be dealing with pedigree collapse, which is going to cause issues with your DNA. Um, for most people with thousands, well, I guess thousands of matches nowadays, maybe not the same, but if you have like tens of thousands of matches and you're dealing with endogamy, then you're going to have, um, you're going to have a little bit more that you're going to have to work on and learn about. But the biggest thing is, is that you need to um, cluster your matches and what I mean by that is look at your DNA matches and then see what other DNA matches are also matching them. So there's the leads method, uh, which is by Dana leads. And it's a very, very popular method. Uh, we'll go to Dana's actual website to show it. Uh, it's a very popular method. So basically the way that it works is, is you put down your first DNA match and, or you, let's say your top four DNA matches and then you go down the list and you, you know, your next DNA match. Are they matching? Okay, you color it. Next one, are they matching? You color it. Are they matching? No, don't color it. Matching? No, don't color it. Matching? No, don't color it. And then matching? Yes, color it. And so then once you've gone down through that first match that you've identified, next go to the next one. And you go and you color it. And then the next one, color it. And what you eventually start finding, it, assuming that you're not dealing with any of those issues I discussed before, or, um, you'll find that it starts uh, starts defining itself pretty well like this. So, you know, you can see these are all DNA matches, but they, none of them are matching over here. And none of these matches are overlapping with any of these other ones. And then these ones are a completely different set. So presumably here we would have four different matches and each one of those matches is representing a different side of your family tree. 
So technically it may be different side, you know, each grandparent. Um, and so now that you've clustered it, so all of these ones that are in this cluster, you know, these same, these same blue ones. Now what you want to do is find out how are they related to each other? And this is where you run into your big issue of if they don't have trees available, you need to learn how to create trees for people that don't give them. Um, and there's a lot of different methods for that, depending on what information you do have, because if you do have DNA matches, um, you may have at least a username, you may have an email, you may have, you know, some other information that they include, depending on the site and what information they upload. So you can try different things that may be helpful. So one that I'll show everyone that's a really great one to use um, if you have a um, Ancestry uh, membership is you can search members. So, you know, if you DNA test and you get a bunch of matches and you're not on Ancestry, you can go on here and then look them up, either search their name, use their username. So, you know, a lot of people go by usernames, try to be somewhat anonymous, but you can actually use that to then find them if they possibly use that username a lot. And so when you put that in, you may be able to find that they have trees, build it that way. Um, another thing to do is also looking into stuff like um, Facebook, Twitter, other social media, you might be able to find them there and kind of build a basic family tree there. Um, you can also go to sites like Genie or Wikitree or places like that and see, you know, are they a member there? Um, and then basically anywhere where you can search for users that are, you know, on tree building sites. And then the other thing is, is stuff like been verified, Spokio, white pages, um, or if you're from different areas of the world, you may have to use other services, but those are a lot of services where you can get a lot of information on living people that, you know, if your DNA matches are presumably living people. And so you can do it that way. And then once you have enough names, especially once you have a somewhat unique name, if you can find an obituary, that's usually one of the best ways to really break it open. Um, and this is a common technique that is something that investigative genetic genealogists have to learn because they are often working with DNA matches that all they're getting is a name, an email, and how much they're matching your DNA match. Um, and you that's what you got to work with. And they, there's no tree supply, nothing. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to build those trees. But once you've identified those clusters, you can start building trees. And then once you've identified how those matches are related, then you can start doing stuff like the what are the odds tool, which I showed earlier. And you don't even need to get all of the matches in that cluster to be matching each other. Once you've gotten just two or three of them, that may be enough fuel for you to figure out what you need to. Obviously, the more matches, the more information, the better. But um, yeah, the other thing to do is you can also look into doing auto clusters. Now, if you are dealing with double relationships, pedigree collapse or endogamy, which just to be more clear, uh, to, to clarify a bit on endogamy, what endogamy literally means is a population group only marrying other people within that same population group. And that could be for various reasons. Often it's geographic, so like island populations, like Weeping Scorpion talking about his Faroe Islands endogamy. Um, there's also um, cultural or religious, so like Jews are an endogamous population. And then there can also be just other various things going on that are going to cause that um, separation of uh, people from marrying each other. And so only marrying within that same group for hundreds of years, it's not just like a couple of generations. Like a lot of people will nickname colonial endogamy, colonial endogamy, but really it's not technically endogamy. It's getting to that point or kind of was, but there's so many people that are marrying in and out of those families that it's kind of different. Um, but with endogamy, Basically, it's going to affect your DNA so that when you look at your matches, they're going to be much higher often in how much they're matching. And you're also going to find that a lot of those matches, all your shared matches are all of your matches. So when you try to do one of these leads chart, 
it would look like almost every match is blue and almost every match is orange and almost every match is yellow and you have tons of overlap and it's really difficult to figure out how to decipher them. Um, and so there's a lot of different techniques to get into that. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, I'll actually, for anyone who's going to Roots Tech, I'll be giving a presentation at Roots Tech, albeit I think it's at 8 a.m. in the morning, which I am not a morning person. So everybody wish me luck on that one. <laughs> I put in a request for them to give me a later time if it opens up, but I'm pretty confident that they're set with the, the schedule. So wish me luck on that. But if you are going to Roots Tech, uh, go go and look that one up because it's, it's me talking about how to overcome issues of endogamy. Um, so, okay, let's keep going. We have lots of comments going on. Uh, yeah, didn't 23andMe get rid of the the shared matches feature they sure did uh ah, charlie's here hey charlie thanks for coming in um i see brian says yeah no changes on my estimates i'm assuming you're talking about my heritage um it, i seem to recall some folks taking test kits to regions that wouldn't buy them on their own poor countries i would buy into that help out in limited scopes countries that can't afford it yeah i mean there's all sorts of various groups that do things like this um and it's not just necessarily poor countries there's different projects as well so like there's the holocaust dna project that uh, dina newman and jennifer mendelson run um and they basically get uh they get dna tests yeah dna reunion project So I'll put that there. So, you know, they help people who are, um, you know, survivors of the Holocaust, DNA test to find their family and uh, others as well. Um, so there's that. I know that uh, there's also, I mean, my specialty is Jewish ancestry. So obviously I'll know a lot of the Jewish ones, but um, Avatenu, which is a big uh, Jewish genealogy group that's been around for a long time. They've had kind of a big newsletter article thing for many years, um, but they've been running a, or they've had a DNA project that they've been overseeing for a long time, which is run by Adam Brown and Michael Waz, two people who are uh, friends of the channel. And if you saw the recent reaction from the IAJGS conference in London, Adam and Michael were both reactors to the video. Uh, or to that video, um, but they've been running one that's a focus of YDNA where they've been going to every possible Jewish community that they could go to, the Kaifeng Jews, the, um, you know, Jews in Romania, the Caribbean Jews, the Jews in South America, uh, you know, Mizrahi Jews, every, you know, basically every community that they could find um, they try, you know, they, they were looking to do Y DNA testing and autosomal DNA testing and a little bit of mitochondrial, but the big focus was Y and then also a little bit with autosomal and with the Y DNA and autosomal, they've been able to find lots and lots of amazing stuff and they still sponsor kits all the time. And then I know, you know, there's just tons and tons of groups out of, out there that you can find. So depending on what you would really like to sponsor in terms of that type of stuff, you can look that up. Like I know that there's a few projects that are focused on getting people in Africa to test. Um, although there's a lot of, you know, a lot of difficulty in that because, you know, there's, you know, you know, why, why would they, you know, trust these people coming over like, Hey, give us your DNA, even if they don't, you know, I don't know. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> I won't go too far into that, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, just jump in here. Oh, Melissa, hi from Washington State. Yeah, we just uh, answered your question. I recognize your... Uh, photo from the the photo from uh, the the dna results so let's see um, all right 
Why do a lot of North African and West Asians in 23andMe always have 100% West Asian and North African and have no admixture with Sub-Saharan African or European? Uh, I mean, the best way to say it is just the way that they've defined and set up the population groups that they have as North African and West Asian. Um, so I, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, it's, you know, this is one of those questions. It's kind of just, I, there, there's kind of like a million answers in a sense of why that could possibly be happening. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> This, this is one of those questions where it comes to a lot of the, um, you know, the admixture stuff where it's just kind of like, you know, it depends on each person what they're going to expect in their ancestry. And, you know, I guess with, you know, if a lot of people from North Africa and West Asia are getting 100% West Asia and North Africa, but no admixture with Sub-Saharan African or European that could actually be technically a good thing if that really is what their entire ancestry is for the past 300 to 500 years. Um, so, yeah. Ah, Ironicles and Sardonicles. Hello, late again. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, is there a simple way I can find the common alternative versions or translations of names? Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a simple way. I mean, the biggest thing is whatever ancestral group that they come from, learning about the surname changes from that group, you know, if there were certain commonalities or especially just, you know, how did they phonetically pronounce it? And how would it have sounded to an American uh, or wherever they landed? If, you know, let's say they were in England, how would that have sounded to an Englishman when they were writing that down? So, you know, every record, one context you need to think about is who was the person writing down that information and how much did they know? So this is actually one of the things where that kind of is funny enough that leads into that whole Ellis Island myth about, you know, names being changed at Ellis Island because people don't understand how well the immigrant inspectors actually knew in terms of the various languages and, you know, how many people that worked as inspectors that were from those countries and spoke those languages fluently and would have known how to write it down properly. Um, but a lot of people presume that it's the other way. And so their context makes it seem like, oh yeah, you know, whatever his name. Oh, joke in, uh, the joke in a lot of Jewish families is, you know, the, the guy where, where they ask him what his name is and he asked the guy next to him, you know, how to say, you know, what's he saying? And the guy says, oh, he's asking for your name. But then later on they ask the same thing, but he forgets what the guy's asking. So he turns to the next guy and he says, forgessing, forgessing, meaning, you know, forgot, I forgot, but they say, okay, Ferguson. And so then all of a sudden he's, you know, Shmuel Ferguson for the rest of his life, but that never happened. You know, even if, if an, an immigrant inspector did write a Ferguson for some guy that was saying that it's not like that would follow that guy for the rest of his life, unless that guy purposely chose to do that. You know, that guy would have to leave Ellis Island basically thinking, well, I guess that's my name now. And then everywhere else he went, just use that as his name. But it was like, it, you know, it, it'd be the equivalent of taking an airplane flight to the, to, to some country and they write your name wrong on the manifest. And all of a sudden that's your name now, because that's what these lists were at Ellis Island. They were manifests. Um, so what was I talking about? <laughs> Sorry, talk about a tangent. Talk about a tangent. So yeah, is there a simple way, um, you know, just just learning the the history and stuff, and um, just kind of phonetically doing it? You might be able to find websites that do talk about surnames specifically for that ancestry. Like I think with Welsh surnames, there's a lot of specific stuff going on, and just yeah, different things to help understand it. Um, okay. Let's see. 
Oh, very cool. Camo Jan, greetings. I'm tardy because I just met with a third cousin I recently met through Ancestry DNA. So cool. That's awesome. Always great to connect. Um, okay, let's jump to some more questions. Uh, so let's see. Reaction suggestion. Oh, well, okay. Well, this isn't a reaction suggestion. Reaction suggestions are videos to suggest that I do a reaction to. This would be DNA for review. Uh, do I want to answer this? Let's see. All right, might as well. We've got it open up. <clears throat> no, Huckleberry, you lucked out. You, you tricked me. <clears throat> you tricked me into it. Okay. My mother got an unknown DNA match. We don't have an idea who this person is. Oh, this will actually be great. So 7.4%, which is a, a really good match, 522.3 cents of Morgans across 16 shared segments, largest segment, 106.6 cents of Morgans. So let's see. No Huckleberry. What do they say? Okay. So first, um, I think, is that Gabrielle? You you are more or less in the same position as I am, but your shared percentage is higher. Still have not been able to discover how the relationship is in in my case. However, the things I've done might help you. According to DNA Painter is equivalent to, yeah, I remember Jarrett stating the amount of cents of Morgans versus the amount of segments, 10 to 1 or less. Yeah, so the amount of cents of Morgans versus the amount of segments is a trick for people with endogamy. So when you have that higher amount of DNA, basically you get a lot of matches that should be be really distant matches but are coming up with over 100 centimorgans so how do you find the true good matches out of the fluff in a sense and one of those ways is doing this um ratio of 10 to 1 so basically when you look at the average segment size of your match is it 10 or higher so with this one obviously you know 522 divided by 16 yeah it's a lot higher than 10 because if you know if it, if it was 160 cents to Morgan's, we'd be at that ratio point. We're well above that. So yeah. So um, let's see. I I read you said your mom and this person seem to be in the same generation. Um. Yeah, Watto gave half first cousin. Okay. Okay, so the thing that nobody mentioned is the thing that I was hoping nobody mentioned. <laughs> and that is this site, dnasci.com slash tool slash segcm. I know you can't see that well, so I'm going to share it in the chat. And so what this site is, this site takes into account not only the shared sense of Morgans, but the number of segments. And the reason for that is because multiple studies have found that recombination rates are different when you're inheriting from your uh, male or from your paternal side versus your maternal side. So basically from my understanding is uh, when women, when the DNA that comes from your mom recombines, it recombines more than the DNA that you're inheriting from your dad. And so using that information, they've been able to start to figure out things like this where they can get a better idea based on the number of segments you share. So here we're looking at, I think this is my heritage. So this is the my heritage ones. So there's different versions. There's this one and then there's the 23andMe one. So the reason for that, which you can see, it says switch back to HIR. That means half identical regions. So when they're looking at DNA, we always say base pair, meaning there's two, um, two alleles at that, that pair or that spot. Gosh, I always, I always have the worst terminology that I use here. So I hope I don't confuse anybody with this. Um, but basically, you know, when you look at your DNA at every spot, there's, you know, you have two base pairs or, you know, two bases. So A, C, T, or G. And I wonder if he has anything on here. No, he has something that goes further into it here. But when you're matching with somebody, 
you can be matching a half identical region, which means instead of matching them at both spots at each base, they only match on one spot, but it's a long segment. But for some matches, you'll have full identical region matching, which then accounts for the fact that you're matching on both sides. So that causes a difference in how they read it. So like if you do, if you do half identical reading, then, and you do a twin, they'll show up as 50% of a match because it's only taking into account the fact that they're matching you across your entire genome at half identical region. They're not, they're not counting both regions. Whereas when you test somewhere where it's a full identical region, it will come out 100%. Whereas a parent is only 50% at a full identical region. So full identical region, you know, you inherit one side of your DNA all from your parents and the other half you inherit from the other parents. So with full identical region, it would come out differently. And I know in one of my videos about the CBC triplets thing, I think that was the one where I mentioned this, but I don't go into details. There's all sorts of people that were like, well, how could you say that identical twins would come out as 50%? They'd be 100%, 100%. It's like, no, I'm not saying that they only share 50% DNA. What I'm saying is the way that these DNA tests read it, which I think most of them are half identical region like we see here as opposed to 23andMe, which is full identical region. And actually it's full identical regions, which is how we do visual phasing. So um, continuing on with uh, this mentioning, so visual phasing is literally looking at your DNA, comparing it with close relatives at your recombination points, and then using those recombination points to determine what, D what part of your DNA came from which grandparent. So here we have the example of one of my chromosomes where I've compared myself with multiple close relatives. And from that, I've then been able to, so this J, this is me. I've been able to determine which grit, which part of my chromosomes come from which grandparents. So we see this is just one chromosome, chromosome two. So in this part, I'm representing this side, top parts, my paternal side, bottom parts, my maternal. So that maternal is split between my maternal grandparents and the paternal split between my paternal grandparents. But by using these recombination points, you can see how we do that. Now we do that using GEDmatch. So if you've ever done a one-to-one -one comparison on GEDmatch, you'll recognize this. And the way that GEDmatch does it is they do theirs using half ident or they use full identical regions. So that's why this looks very different um, because basically what they're showing is up in this top part where it's yellow, that means that it's matching at a half identical region. So the yellow spots, it's only matching one base of a base pair. When it's green, it's matching full identical, both base pairs. And so you can see how there's some where it's, you know, even though this is a big segment of half identical region, there's still some readings that are fully identical. Whereas this big block, we can see that that big block is a fully identical region. So this is actually a comparison of myself to my sister. And so from that, we're then able to actually determine. So my sister and I, at that spot, have to be sharing DNA we inherited from this both grandparents on both sides. So both our paternal side has to be, we're inheriting that from both our paternal side at that spot and our maternal side at that spot. So that's where the, you know, this is the fully identical versus half identical region stuff comes in. So we're going to switch back to half identical region. So that's a long, long explanation for that. So 522.3. So we don't really need to worry about the point three so much. And then 16 segments. So now looking at that. So now we have half first cousin group. And it's not really, that's not giving us a whole lot more information than what we already have because, you know, it's pretty similar to what they're kind of already, you know, what we're already noticing, which I think, where was it mentioned? Somebody mentioned it. Um, yeah, basically, you know, DNA Painter, the the shared Santa Morgan project gave it an 89%. Here it's giving it a 57% for a half first cousin group. 
Um, so that, that includes a lot. <laughs> you can see half first cousin, half grandparent, or a second great aunt, uncle, niece, or nephew. Then um, first cousin, once removed, is 28.3%. But now this stuff right here, this is where SEG-CM really shines, is in terms of some of the closer matches where it can really tell you, okay, well, if it is a great grandparent or a great grandchild relationship, which there is a 5% possibility that it is, the most likely scenario is that it's a maternal, maternal great grandparent. Next highest possibility is that it's a paternal, maternal, or maternal, paternal. And then the least likely is paternal, paternal. And so this has to do with, if you remember, that when you're looking at maternal side, there's more recombination there than your paternal side. So what this is telling us is that the number of segments that we're seeing here is probably a higher or a lower number um, than you would see with someone with maternal maternal because someone with maternal maternal would likely see a higher number of segments. So let's say we up that to 22 and let's see what changes um, in terms of like notice every single spot, it kind of, did it already change? No, it did. Okay. So let's do 2022. Okay, so it did change, but not a whole lot. But we noticed that it did. Let's see, did it go up on both? Yeah, it went up on both. Okay, so it went. To, so, but let's say it's twenty-five. And so it, it's yeah, interesting. Now let's say it's twelve. Okay, so then twelve paternal paternal goes up because with paternal paternal you're going to have less recombination so fewer segments so yeah so more segments more maternal maternal but then let's see what 30 does so yeah 30 so you can see how just the number of segments we're keeping Santa morgan's here but number of segments is changing the data quite quite a lot um all right let's let's check chat I just thought that was kind of funny. I'm chatting with a real person in Ancestry, simply asking to pass the request along to give us more than 24 custom group color dots to organize DNA matches. I'm out of colored dots. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a common issue for people that are, you know, on their really in-depth uh, profiles. Um, okay, I see a lot of chatting about, about this Clark family. Really interesting, all these tools that you're snowing us. Yes, I'm snowing them down upon you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, well, this is, I, I guess, in my mind, when I do these reactions and stuff, this is kind of the main thing I really want to go for with this is, you know, I want to be able to explain stuff in a, a in depth way so that people can understand it while also showing tools and various things that even for those who are knowledgeable enough to answer the questions I'm already answering. I may give information that they didn't even already realize or think about. So like with this one, you know, no one seemed to have mentioned this site. Granted, it's not, as I mentioned, you know, with the 16 cents. Yeah. It's not really giving that big of a difference in terms of what it's telling us. It seems to be indicating, yeah, probably going to be a half first cousin because a half, I mean, depending on the age, it's going to vary, but I think they said same age. Um, where they estimated it was so uh yeah showing <laughs> so yeah all right let's uh wow this uh this was a pretty good one to stumble upon even though they they put the wrong flare you lucked out no huckleberry is it yeah no huckleberry all right this question was answered during the professional genealogist Rayax live stream on february 13th 2024 in the year of our lord 20 wait yeah 
2024. I don't know if anyone's run across a lot of those. Uh, I feel like it's mostly in the 1700s where they, they, they don't say 1700, whatever they say, the year of our Lord, 1744, or whatever. I don't know. I think that's funny. Okay. Yeah. Reviewed, flared. Um, okay. So let's see. I think, yeah, I skipped this one. Uh, it's like a lot of results stuff. All right. Let's, uh, you know what? Let's do, let's see if we can scroll back. Okay. I see a few that are on the older side. How long have I been going? Okay, I've been going for an hour. I think, yeah, I think I'll answer one more. Try to keep it only about an hour and a half today. Um, so let's see if we can find one that's about two years ago. Huh, let's see what this is. I got inspiration from useful charts and used LibreOffice from Frequent Pipe. All right, so I'm assuming Frequent Pipe must be Mitchell Troxel. Okay, yeah. So they, they're Charlie Manson's relative and Randolph McCoy. I don't... I'm not familiar. Patriarch of the McCoy... Oh, Hatfield McCoys. Oh, cool. Okay. So he was a McCoy. That's interesting. I had no idea. He's also a descendant of Calvin Klein. Uh, okay. Okay, Flamingo. I know I've seen a lot of their questions. All right, let's look at this one. Centimorgan segment size. And this one's from a year ago. Does it say exactly when? December 28th. Okay, good. A little over a year. All right. I have a match on my maternal great grandmother's side. So let's do this. That is behind a brick wall. I know this due to a triangulated match that is on my side of the brick wall. I've contacted her, but unfortunately, her research is also at a brick wall in that particular branch as well. I'm trying to de determine how closely her and my mother are related, but DNA Painter gives a fairly wide range. I know she's not a first cousin of my mother, but beyond that, I don't really know. She's roughly 10 years younger than my mother, so it seems likely they are the same generation. How much does the size of matching segments tell about how closely related you are? She shares 107 centimorgans with my mother, with the largest segment being 43 centimorgans. Would that mean they are closer match? <clears throat> my mother also matches with her two sisters and nephews as well in lower centimorgans amount 73, 62, 62. Any suggestions on how to determine our connection would be be greatly appreciated and let's see what's said okay yeah so we've got matt here which i haven't seen him in the chat charlie was here for a second i don't know if charlie's still here maybe in the background um but yeah probability wise you're almost definitely in the first to third cousin range the obvious problem is you've got one removed or half relationship to take into account from my understanding a larger segment size indicate Indicated a close relationship on those DNA painter might show you as you're inheriting segments from ancestors. Yeah, it can vary. It, it, the The largest segments are a good measurement to get an idea of you know how stronger the relationship may be in terms of those ranges. Um, but sometimes it's just a matter of the randomness of recombination, and you both just happen to inherit a huge chunk of the same spots. Um, but yeah, so, okay. Given the average sense of Morgan in common with the members of that family is 76.25. The estimates are, and then he lists all the following. So I assume you've compared your trees to see where the gaps are at great, great grandparents level. I guess it's about their comparison of ethnicities to see if you can work out where the person came from. Obviously you might never know if there's been infidelity or NPE. Um, yeah. Mother was adopted. Ha! Huh. Physical man, that's the site we just used, saying CM. And then I've never—I don't think I've used the DNA adoption app before. Um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we are—we are looking at a pretty 
decent match, but not super close. And especially with her being the highest amongst her, you know, two sisters and a nephew, that would seem to really indicate that, you know, the, even with that big segment, focusing on that average, like what Matt did, gives a good idea of where we really may be looking for. Um, yeah, I mean, beyond that, it's really a matter of, you know, trying to just pinpoint within those trees. So, you know, for one, you've kind of got it pinpointed in your tree, at least, because you have a cousin you've triangulated with. Then the next question is, can you do that with her side? Although you're going to be running into a lot of issues if, um, you know, she was a uh, adopted or was it her adopted? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, it might just be a difficult one. I mean, you know, I have some matches very similar to this where, you know, I've got stuff figured out where we're kind of close to having an idea, but there's just not enough information available either in the records or through DNA matching stuff to really be able to, to tell, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Reviewed. One hundred and thirty fourth. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. So, okay, good. So we got one that was decently far back. So, <clears throat> yeah, the thing that I would say to uh, everybody, definitely go on to the Reddit, even if you don't have questions to, to post. And, you know, scroll through. I would highly suggest try looking at a lot of the older ones too. give them some love because uh, there might be some really good questions hiding back there. And, you know, I, I'd like to try to answer as many as possible, but I've definitely hit a point where there's so many questions that it's like, I may not hit all of them. <laughs> um, but go in, upvote for the ones that you're like, yeah, I want to see that question answered or what, you know, whatever that is. Um, and then every time I do one of these, that's how we'll decide it. Uh, let's see what chat's saying. Check in with chat. Uh, okay, kind of chatting here. Okay, Charlie is here. And uh, yeah, great, great spot to put it to. Please join our Discord server if you haven't already. Um, it's a really, really active community. And we've been working on, you know, improving it and really getting things going, which, you know, I have to give a big shout out to Matt, Charlie, and Blackberry Rose, who have all been doing amazing stuff with this. Um, but let's see. Yeah, here we go. So we've got, you know, a lot of stuff always going on, lots of different chats. Uh, hopefully that's kind of readable. Um, but we've also started this help request forum. So if you have requests for help, you know, I won't guarantee that I'm going to be the one answering it, but we have a very active community of very knowledgeable people and a lot of people who um, can answer that. So, you know, definitely post your questions to Reddit if you have them, but we have a whole other area for you to be able to, um, you know, access that stuff and, and or access access people who, who are, are knowledgeable. Um, <clears throat> and then I think beyond that, I know one of the big questions I always get is, you know, are you going to make yourself available for, um, you know, consultations or private genealogy, things like that. I do have one-on-one -on -one consultations available through my Patreon. So you do need to get a Patreon tier membership to be able to do that. Currently I am working towards being able to have that available outside of Patreon. Um, although with Patreon, you do get a lot of great benefits with it beyond just 
the one-on-one. -on -one. For one, you get a lot of access to exclusive videos um, and uh, early, early, early access every once in a while when I'm able to get ahead of things. Um, so, you know, lots of ways to get help and do all of that fun, fun stuff. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining me on the uh, stream today. It's uh, awesome to see how, you know, I mean, I've been doing these streams now for, uh, I guess it's been over a month now, hasn't it? I'm trying to remember when I first really started them, but the community's really been amazing and just so many people popping in and out. And I feel like I'm really getting to know a lot of you a lot better too. So these are a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, Friday, still trying to figure out what I'm going to do for the Friday stream. I'm still kind of trying to think of something that's not the typical, just building a family tree. I am thinking I might do the, uh, there's a tier ranking list for genealogy TV shows, uh, which I think I might do. Although I did peek at it and there are a lot of shows on there that I'm not even familiar with. Although I know I'm the one that put it together, but <laughs> I did it years ago when and I had a bunch of people tell me shows to put in there and then I plan to watch stuff and I just didn't. So I don't know, maybe I'll put a poll out later at some point or something. Um, and uh, yeah, I see a, a couple of, a couple of people coming. So yeah, when's the next live stream? It's going to be Friday on the main channel and uh, yeah, it should be, should be a good time. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call it, but thank you very much, everybody. You have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you all on Friday.